Hello and uh, welcome everyone uh, and thanks for joining my session this afternoon. So my name is Joe Anatby and uh, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was asked to come here and give you a little bit about uh, my story as an entrepreneur but uh, I don't think I'm that interesting as a person so I'll actually switch the topic to what are my two cents uh, actually on becoming a successful entrepreneur. And it's absolutely not that I that I have figured it out or I, I have a secret source than, that nobody else has. But at least I'm willing, to, uh, happy to share my experiences and what I do believe it's very important to become successful as an entrepreneur. So let me share uh, my screen with you here. Hope you can see my view full screen. So, my two cents on how to become a to be a to be successful, and I have to say this is as an entrepreneur, I have no uh, answer to how do you become successful in life in general. So this will be highly focused on your life as an entrepreneur because I know many of you in the audience today are entrepreneurs or aspire to become an entrepreneur. So, no intention to talk about life in general, but specifically about entrepreneur. So, starting with one of the, uh, I think one of the most characters or traits amongst all the successful entrepreneurs is this, is grit. Being an entrepreneur is not easy. It's probably one of the toughest, hardest things you can ever do. And you will fail, 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 and you will be punched in the face. You have to stand up again. So I think one of the most important characteristics in an entrepreneur is to have grit. To, to, to fail, but stand up and try again, fail again, try again, and eventually you might be successful. But it's absolutely not a given. So grit is a very, very important characteristic uh, for becoming an entrepreneur. And going through my story i think this has been the number three has been uh, a, a very recurring theme in my life and i'll come to that in a bit why that has become a key number for me and if we start to give because i was asked to give you a little bit of my background and my story and starting with the number three so my life more or less started with uh, two fails The, the fail number one was this. This is, uh, this is my first career. Uh, I was a cyclist for about 10 years, between the age of 10 and 20. Uh, I do believe I, I was ranked number three in Sweden, whatever that means. But uh, I spent a, <laughs> quite a bit of time in, in the saddle. Uh, so I was super uh, ambitious, uh, trained ex exceptionally hard. But uh, when I was 19, uh my knee uh couldn't take all the strain so uh i had to had to do surgery and uh this is uh the the, the picture here it's it's it look this is now 20 years ago i did it i the method back then was not that sophisticated so i think i have a scar that that's 15 centimeter long on my right knee but uh, and uh i was out of the saddle for six months i was on crutches uh and I, I, I tried. I tried to get back again, but uh, but I couldn't. Uh, so my first, this was a fail. I always wanted to be, or not always, but I wanted to become a professional cyclist, but that didn't happen uh, because of an injury, which is which is often the case in many many sports, not just in cycling. And you all only read about the successful ones, but there are many that are trying and have to get up, give up because of uh, because of injuries, and I was one of them. So. Fail number one, fail number two, or I, I wouldn't call this a fail because that's actually, this, this one actually led up to my, to, to, to the win. But uh, so instead of, instead of being a cyclist, I decided to, I always love mathematics and physics. So I start engineering physics at the Chalmers University of Technology. And so I got a master's there pretty quickly. And after that, I, uh, after I was done with my, 
Masters, I got super excited about uh, AI. Note that this is 15, 15, 20 years ago, so this is not for joining any kind of <laughs> any kind of hype. But uh, I started the PhD uh, in artificial intelligence, and I did that uh, part of that at the Santa Fe Institute, which is this uh, gorgeous place in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I think they have three or four Nobel Prize winners at the campus. I was uh, I was super excited uh, to be at that place and for uh, for learning about uh, learning about AI. So I did that for for a couple of years, uh, published some papers, but then I felt like this. This is uh, I got super exhausted uh, because there were uh, a ton of smart people. There were people from China, from Russia that spent. Uh, 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 16 hours a day when they wake up in the morning until the more or less until they uh, went to bed at night they work extremely hard and they were extremely smart and I thought if this is I also have other interests this is I don't want to have a life where, where it's all about this this uh, mathematics so I decided to or I, I, I thought I, I was going to take a break from my studies and return to my PhD, <laughs> but, uh, but that never happened. So I decided to switch gear and start a, my first uh, company. And of course, I wanted to leverage what I, what I learned uh, at, during my master's and during my PhD studies. So I decided to go after uh, the, the PC support industry. So these are people that are freaked out because their computers uh, don't work. So the opportunity I saw here was around, okay, what if, if I crowdsource, start crowdsourcing a lot of data from uh, the user, from the operating system, and then I use AI, I use machine learning to actually figure out the root cause of the problem and fix it. And of course, that was it, it sounds very, very easy in theory. Of course, it wasn't because I was I was 20 something young and naive. But uh, uh, but I started the company. Uh, and around this, I raised uh, I was successful as raising uh, quite a bit of venture capital. Uh, but it's been a, it's it was a roller because the name of that company was Tiffic. Uh, started and uh, raised venture capital. We built out the product. Uh, we hit so many roadblocks because, of course, it wasn't that easy. Just it sounds easy to use AI to fix those Windows-based computer problems, but of course it wasn't. We stumbled upon a lot of roadblocks and and everything. As you do as a first-time entrepreneur, uh, I would say also as a second and third and fourth-time uh, entrepreneur as well. Hopefully, you learned something along the way. But uh, it was definitely a roller coaster. But after uh, I would say five years. Uh, we got our shit together, uh, meaning A, we got a product that uh, was decent, uh, not sure I would call it an MVP or, but, or product market fit, but it was good enough to sell. And we started to get some traction. And in 2006, I moved to Silicon Valley because we, this was a big platform that we sold to companies like AT&T and Comcast and, and everything. So I moved to Silicon Valley, I built sales and marketing there, kept, kept R&D, kept finances, kept operations in Sweden, built, built, built out the marketing and sales part in the States and me. And then uh, finally we managed to get Microsoft as a customer and I did that sales myself. And when, when you do support for the Windows-based operating system, it, it, it simply doesn't get any bigger than selling, selling your technology to, uh, to Microsoft or getting them as a customer. So we decided to sell the company. We got an offer, we used a banker, and the company was, my first company, Tiffic, was acquired by a company on the East Coast, which was great. Uh, I, so I moved from Silicon Valley to, the buyer was on the East Coast, uh, outside Boston, so move from from west coast to east coast and uh, i was i have to say i've been working many many years for making uh tiffic successful uh, after the sales i was super exhausted so it was really really hard to re uh, to to get the energy level back up again doing the same but but for now for an, another owner so this is in i I, I was locked in for a year and a half and uh 
spending that time in Bo Boston wasn't bad because I got addicted to two things that they do that they're great at. One is Sam Adams that comes from Boston. Uh, second, they have this lobster roll where you stuff where you take a piece of bread a bread roll and you stuff it with uh, <laughs> uh, with lobster and then you have butter on top of it and serve it together with chips. It's amazing. But during this lock-in period, I felt pretty much immediately, this is not where I want to end my life. I'm an entrepreneur. I really love the phase where you're innovating, where you're growing, when you're scaling. Uh, I'm not the right person to, uh, to, to run a, a company with thousands of people where it's more about the EBITDA margin than, uh, than how do you actually innovate and do the next, <laughs> do the next step as a company. But during this time, I, I was allowed to do angel investing, uh, which I think is quite fun. So I invested in a bunch of companies. I joined boards. I did speaking gigs like this. But frankly, I knew I wanted to do at least one more, start one more company. So uh, I, I spent a fair bit of time thinking about, not a huge surprise given my background in mathematics, I'm very analytical in how I think about things. So. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a bit, but the company I started uh, was a, the company where that I'm currently running and I'm CEO and founder of. It's a company called Fishbrain. I don't know if you heard about it, but it's it's a community for people who love fishing, which is the uh, sport fishing is the world's largest hobby. And now we have 10 million users, uh, 10 million catches. We have a user base. Uh, most of our users are in the US. Uh, and raised a fair bit of venture capital for, for this one. It's I raised $40 million, uh, probably even a little bit more uh, to get where we are today for Fishbrain. Been able to get attract some, some uh, spectacular investors. I don't know if you, you know who these guys are, but the, the guy to the left-hand side is uh, Facebook co-founder uh, Eduardo Severin. I think his net worth, personal net worth is $10 billion or something like that surprisingly humble and I got to know him really really well so he's a, he's a fun dude uh, I'm not sure he likes the the movie the social network that much but so so and he has a VC firm where he's one of the these uh, LPs in B capital which is a global investment fund they're one of the uh, key owners on in Fishbrain the other one to the right hand side is uh, Masayoshi Sun which is the CEO of SoftBank uh, so we have actually have SoftBank uh, as an investor in uh, Fishbrain, which is quite interesting. Note though that they, they have two funds. They have this, this one is the Vision Fund. That's the one that write billion dollar tickets in companies like Uber and Diddy and the likes. And we got money from the Ventures Fund, which is the smaller fund where they can invest millions of dollars, but not billions. So we got money from the Ventures Fund. But I have an interesting lineup of investors. And of course I have local ones as well. I have North Zone, I have Industry Fund. So I have really good owners behind the company. But, uh, and this is, uh, I, I generally don't read uh, management literature because it's, it's mostly 100%, 99% BS. But I think this one is, I would highly recommend this because it's called range. And this speaks about the importance of actually having a range of experiences uh, for being good at something. And I think that's that's been the case for me. I've been a cyclist, I've been in academia, now I'm an entrepreneur. And I think all these things that I've done prior in, in life actually have helped me become much better at what I'm doing today. So so don't hesitate to try new things uh, and, and also be a generalist and learn a lot of different things. But, okay, so that's, that's, that's basically my background. And so giving you my two cents on how to become successful as an entrepreneur. And of course, the first one is, first of all, you have to decide this is what you want to do, uh, to be an entrepreneur, which is, which, is, which is not a given. There are not a lot of different career choices today. Entrepreneur is one of them. And it's my absolute favorite, but it doesn't have to be the favorite for, for, for everyone. But if you decided that I want to try that out, I want to become an entrepreneur. So how do you, how do you select your company? And again, I have created a little bit of framework for myself and the other companies that I'm involved in. And based on number three, uh, number one, of course, this is not rocket science, but I think a lot of the, the founders that I speak with, they haven't done enough homework on 
what is actually the real market size of their business because it's very very easy to inflate this number you actually have to look at what's act actually the addressable market you are going after uh, because i think you have to for me it's i don't want to go after anything that's small because if you, that doesn't mean that you cannot create an, a very very successful company in a small market but then you have to have perfect 100% execution because if you fail just a little bit then you won't be successful and to get execution 100% right is almost impossible but if you go after something that's huge then it's typically room for a lot of players and even if you're not 100% in execution the pie is big enough for you to to get a chunk at it so when i looked at starting fishbank I, I, I dug into this in quite some detail and found out that this is the world's largest hobby. Uh, there are 49 million anglers in the US. Uh, that's, it. that's before COVID-19 because with the pandemic, there would be rough 10 million new people coming into sport fishing in the US this year just because of COVID-19. And they also spend a, 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 a shitload of money on their hobby. It's a $50 billion industry uh, in the US. So it's much, much bigger than golf and hunting and music and cycling and running, all those things that you one think is big. Fishing is actually bigger in terms of spend. There are more people running in the US that, than there are uh, fishing, but as a runner, you don't spend that, that much money and running shoes and shorts and a few other things. Anglers, they have tens of rods and reels and they travel and whatnot. So market uh, size is to me important. But also maybe, maybe you should, thinking about the market it might not be good to go after the absolutely largest markets either i think you have to find the right range today because not too small but if you go after say you want to go after insurance or if you want to go after health uh, you will get competition from the big guys that are constantly expanding especially amazon but also google so it might be good to find a sweet spot where the market the addressable market is in the the billions, but uh, but may, might not be the biggest ones. Then I also look at the macro trends. This is very important too, because it's very, very hard to swim upstreams. So this is about finding what are the, the trends that you, be, you believe in will happen in society. And of course, it's not that I have a crystal ball that uh, the tier one VCs like a Sequoia or Greylock or the others have, but you have to really think about something and think what what do you believe are the next big macro trends and this is what i did for fish brain because i didn't go for fish i'm actually not that good at fishing i know how to fish but I, I i went after two macro trends and one is the i believe it if you have a passion for something doesn't matter what it is i think you will have a much better engagement if you're in a group of like-minded rather than in a group of friends so I do believe that there's a, an opportunity for vertical social networks for the big hobbies. And I actually wrote a blog post before I started Fishbrain about this. And it was published as this tech blog in Silicon Valley. And I got a ton of feedback from Mark Andreessen and Greylock and Sequoia. So, so that I did before starting Fishbrain. Finally, it's about timing. Timing is everything. And I think, do believe this is the hardest part. It's really, really hard because many companies start too early. There was an e-commerce boom early 2000, but the market wasn't ready. The bandwidth wasn't big enough. It wasn't good enough for uh, shipping wasn't ready. There are so many pieces that weren't ready. So it failed. E-commerce, of course, it's huge today, but the, so it wasn't anything wrong with it. It was just that the timing was wrong. And that's Fishbrain. I probably started that a couple of years too early and uh, because Instagram was growing this big and people brag about the catches on Instagram as well. And, and my first company, Tiffic, I probably started that five, six years too early because the market wasn't ready for what I was delivering. So timing is very, very important. So I know I'm running over time here, so I, I probably need to wrap up. But then if you start, uh, you start a company, how do you make it successful? I do believe number three again. There are three things that are dear to me. Passion is number one. I don't think you can create a successful company unless you're actually passionate about what you're doing.
I'm back again. So, sorry. Something you really think you need to be passionate about. I'm not a passionate angler, but I'm absolutely 100% passionate about building a successful company. And I think that's a really a cultural culture you want to build in all companies. If you look at early people of, of Spotify, or if you, they were all super passionate. Daniel is super passionate. Sebastian at Klarna is super passionate. You should, I think you really need to be, have that passion and drive to become successful. Doing something half-heartedly won't make it. You have to do something that's brilliant today because it's very competitive market. So you really need to be passionate about what you're doing. Second, velocity. I think this is very key. Uh, you have to execute and execute very, very fast. Be data-driven, do a lot of A-B tests, always prioritize velocity because your competitors, if there's anyone running faster than you, they might not be smarter, but they run faster. They will beat you because there are many businesses today with network effects and when they hit the tipping point or they're able to raise more venture capital than you are or attract better, smarter people, they will beat you. So velocity, when I look at Fishman and all other companies, velocity is critical. And finally, you have to take risk. This is, there's, there's no way out of this. You have to take risks. Most startups will fail. I think at series A stage, nine out of 10 go bust. And that's just the na nature of the game. You have to take risk. And I think that's the problem, not so much in the early stages, but for example, a company like Fishbrain today, we need to continue to take risk. Otherwise we can be beaten by some other company that are willing to take more risk than we are. And I think that's it. Thank you.